you're going to go a long ways before you find somebody that's a bigger fan of skill saws than I am. I've used one for 43 years. That's a fair piece of time. And I've used, probably I've owned, I would say probably a dozen, more or less, like this one. A year and a half ago, Skill sent me this one. I didn't pay for it, but I've been getting acquainted with it now for about 18 months. And even though I've been putting it off, I think it's time for me to do a review on this thing. I think that one of the reasons that I've put this tool review off and have sort of been dreading it is because I had this assumption that the conclusion had to be which saw was better and which saw was going to continue to ride in my truck and which one was going to be stuck in the shop. It finally dawned on me that that was nonsense. These are different tools and both of them will ride in my truck all the time in the same way that my cordless drill and my corded half-inch drive heavy-duty porter cable drill are always found in the same truck at the same time and in fact often are used on the same jobs. The first and most obvious, certainly, the most obvious advantage is you're not dragging a cord. I was looking forward to that, but I underestimated how nice that was going to be at form setting time. Building concrete forms without a cord following you around and getting hung up on the concrete stakes is really nice. It's, all a really, it's also really nice on poor day when you're on poor watch and you're stripping forms and you're solving problems that have to be solved right now. It's nice not to drag that cord around where the guys are stepping on it and tripping on it. So that is a giant plus. I didn't have to give up anything in terms of power. This thing pulls in the hand, in the cut, just as hard as this one does when it's fully charged. And the charge lasts a good long time. In fact, I haven't run one of these batteries dead yet in a cut. Now I'm fairly assiduous about keeping them on the charger because I'm gonna hate it when the time comes that it quits me in the middle of a hard pull. But I can just say confidently that this thing is a hard battery to exhaust. It's got lots of power in it. The other piece of being cordless that is just a giant plus is if you have one small task, one little problem to solve, just one or two cuts to make, it's really great to be able to just jerk it out of the toolbox, walk to the site of the work, make the cut, and be done. I mean, clearly you're not spending the time rolling out and rolling up that you are with a corded saw. Now there are probably people whose jobs make that an everyday occurrence. I'm not that guy. I mean, usually I'm in one spot working for a long time on a pretty good size project, so that's not that important to me. But there have been a few times for me already where a onesie-twosie kind of a problem to be solved has been made easier to solve because I'm not dragging a cord. The convenience aspect of not having a cord is not just convenient for the guy that's running the saw, it's convenient for the people for whom their cords and their hoses are not tangled up with the cord of the guy that's running the saw, right? So there's some spin-off sort of benefit in having a cordless saw on the job and not just for you, but for the people for whom the job is less sort of cluttered and fewer trip hazards. And I don't know if that's a real deal or not, but it can be at a particular moment. As far as comparing the operation in your hand, the, the way that the nuts and bolts of the thing cause the saw to function, there's more that's identical than is different. The only two things that are noticeably different in terms of function of the pieces are the safety lockout on having to press that one way or the other before you pull the trigger, and the fact that it's just a little bit of a soft start as the, as the blade spins up, and a very instantaneous shutoff. So those are somewhere between a neutral and a plus, right? I mean, it's just, it's all right. The, the rest of the mechanism, the way the table controls and tilts and the way that the angle of the grip and the way that the, it feels in your hand when you grab it, they're all the same. It is the same saw with a big battery right underneath the heel of your hand. So there are two primary differences between this saw and this one that change the way that I'm even thinking about these saws to where they are not two saws that are competing for the number one position, but an apple and an orange, or an orange and an apple. They are different, and let me explain to you why. These batteries are heavy, like heavy. You would expect them to be heavy because they're holding a lot of whatever it is that enables it to hold the electricity, right? So number one, that's a heavier saw than this one. I wouldn't want to use this overhead very long, in fact, at all. 
in general, in general, I wouldn't want to cut out of position with this. This is really good for use at a bench or with a set of sawhorses because that heavy battery right underneath my hand radically changes the balance of this saw. Can you see that these old guys are entirely out ahead of your hand? They are holding, you are holding out on the end of your forearm the whole weight of the saw and gravity wants to drop it. So most of my cuts, if you'll watch a carpenter using one of these, the thing is almost always pointing to the ground when he pulls the trigger. That includes the Larry Hahn trick of lining up the edge of the table with the edge of the stud and with a plunge cut, bam, getting a nice square cut as the saw falls into the work rather than as the saw is pushed across the work. Can you see that? I hadn't thought through well enough to describe fully why it was that I always find myself cutting like that, that I drop the saw into my cuts, even on a two by six or a two by four. And the reason is because the weight of the saw drops into position and then drops through the cut. And you are establishing the line of the cut relative to the pencil line on the board as it disappears into the whole pencil line, not simply as it approaches a pencil line from the edge and then it's pushed into the cut. Can you see that difference? I can tell you that it makes these completely different in the function. One is wanting to drop into the cut like that and one is wanting to lay down on the board and be pushed across. Is one better than the other? I don't know. But this is the one that I've grown up using. And it's more than confirmation bias when I tell you that I can do things with this that I would never be able to do with this in a production out of position cutting situation. So if I worked at a bench all the time, if I even worked at a bench half the time, I think that this difference in balance would sort of fade into insignificance, right? And the fact that they have made the handle a dust collection point would get better. But if I was just cutting rips on pieces of plywood in a cabinet shop or whatever it is, this might become my all around, my daily driver, maybe. But there's a couple of reasons why a cord is not in fact a negative and becomes a really serious positive that you may not have thought of and I probably had not fully appreciated it until I was carrying this thing around trying to do some of the work finishing up the top part of this house. The first of those is that it's lighter. Now yes, a cord weighs something, but you rarely have more than what, four or five or six feet of the cord suspended from the saw. So this saw weighs less than this saw by a wide margin. But the next advantage to a cord that just has to be experienced to be appreciated is that it puts your saw on a string, on a rope. And when you're working off the ground, whether it's just on a set of floor joists or on a ladder or up into the rafters, it is really nice to be able to lower that thing or climb up there yourself and then grab the cord that you threw over the wall and pull it up. I mean, that's a that is a plus that in the small amount of time that I was using this in the upstairs became almost a deal breaker in a roof stacking situation where if there's not a rope on my saw, I either A, can't get a hold of it or B, can't let it down without actually putting myself in harm's way and having to give up a handhold or carry a saw down the ladder or, or, or. Sometimes it's really nice to have a rope on your saw. And the cord, ladies and gentlemen, is that. It's a rope on your saw. So I guess the last thing that I would point out as being an improvement on this saw, and once again, it's not enough to, to obviate the tried and true, but it certainly deserves mention, and that is that that is a better sky hook. It's wide enough to slip over the top flange on most eye joists. And that's a good thing because you don't want to be cutting into your eye joists like I can get away with on a, on a dimensional board. And you don't want your saw falling to the ground because the little sky hook doesn't quite get a hold of that. So, so that's good. The dust collection capacity on the handle, that's good. I don't know if they're ever going to put that on the regular skill saws. The balance point is hard for me to get used to. The power is great. The uh, convenience of being able to run around wherever you want without having to, you know, worry about cord length or walking through a, you know, a mud puddle or whatever. All of those things are a plus. And the takeaway is this. It doesn't have to be, if you're a pro, you don't have to think of this as an either or proposition. It's rather 
one tool is ideally suited for one set of um, challenges and the other tool is ideally set for a different set of challenges. So just decide what you're up against and that's what you get out of the truck in the morning. So as I wrap this up, I want to thank Skillsaw for sending me this saw. I don't think I ever would have bought it, but I'm darn sure glad I own it and I will put a few miles on this thing before I come to the end of the line, right? So Skillsaw, thanks a million, but I don't want you for a second to think that you can back off on this one. That's the tool everybody ought to have first. And then if you decide you need to expand your capacity or, you know, get right into the middle of the 21st century, go ahead and add this. But I got to tell you, this guy is going to be hard to beat. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.